Hello, everyone. Good evening and welcome to this gathering. This is a 40 days live event when we are exploring anti-racist and decolonial theologies. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church, and it's very good that you are here. This event is offered as part of the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, uh, which began on October 10th and is running through until the very end of November. Uh, this is week two. Of the, of, of the 40 days, and there are writers um, who have written uh, daily reflections for this week, as there are every week. Uh, this is the live event that we are at right now, and there's a featured book of the week called Wait is an Anti-Racist. There are also study groups that are available, and it's not too late to sign up. It's possible to sign up and participate in uh, study groups who will be gathering weekly to discuss the weekly writings, reflections, and engage in conversation. So you're welcome to sign up for that if you would like on Church X. And as noted, there is a featured book of the week. This week's uh, book is called Wait Is It Wait Is This Racist? And it's a guide to becoming an anti-racist church. It's a really practical uh, book for exploration and it's available at the United Church Bookstore. Uh, and if you were to order two or more books, you can receive a discount of 20% off uh, using the discount code 40 days. Uh, so all of this and more is on the 40 days website and you're welcome to explore and engage all of that. Uh, so again, we are very glad that you are here. Um, with this, I would uh, actually love to turn this over now to my colleague, uh, Jennifer Jansen Ball, who is the Executive Minister for, the for Theology and Ministry Leadership, and she will be guiding the conversation today. So welcome to everyone and welcome to Jennifer. Thanks, Adele. Uh, it's great to see so many people here. I didn't have a sense of how many people would be joining. So it's great to welcome everybody and uh, see everybody here. Um, I'm very happy to introduce the three people who will be engaging in conversation today. First, Becca Whitlaw, who is the Professor of Practical Ministry and the Lydia Grucci Chair of Pastoral Studies at St. Andrew's College in Saskatoon. And then Nestor Medina, who is the Associate Professor of Religious Ethics and Culture at Emmanuel College in Toronto. And finally, Amy Haynes, who is the co-chair of the National Anti-Racism Common Table, uh, a candidate for ministry and a graduate from the Vancouver School of Theology. And Amy is in Calgary. So welcome again, everybody, and a special welcome to our conversation panelists today. I'm going to start off with... Um, uh, a, Sorry, one more thing. Um, Al Cruz Lamonji was supposed to be one of our speakers tonight. And unfortunately, she's unable to join us because she's sick. So she sends her regrets. Uh, she really did want to be part of this, but is unable to at this point in time. But hopefully at a future um, event, we'll be able to hear from Al Cruz because she has lots of wisdom to offer to this work of the church as well. So our panelists are going to go in the um, order that we I introduced them in, and we have two questions to focus. So they'll each have uh, some time to respond to, to the first question. I'll be listening, as I think all of you will be, for some themes that I might pull out and then uh, just name those, and, and um, our panelists will have some conversation about that. And then we'll move on to the second question in same kind of format. I'll, again, listen for some themes and then uh, name those, and our panelists will have some chance to talk about that. So that's the general format for our time together tonight. So the first question, um, and Becca will be going first for this one, then we'll reverse the order, I should say, for the second question. Um, in your respective field, how do you understand the connection between anti-racism and decolonial initiatives? And is there a distinction between those two? Hi, everybody. I, I want to bring greetings from where I am in Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. And I also want to just take a moment to shout out to some people who are in the room who, who have been in class all day and who are gluttons for punishment. So they're still here. Some students in our um, 
uh, United Church History course that we're offering this week as an intensive and some students from the designated lay ministry program, which is also happening here at St. Andrews this week. Uh, so we're all, all enjoying the time of being together. So thanks for to those folks for being here and a shout out to you. For me, um, I, I think what I want to do is start with a general comment about the connections between anti-racism and decolonial initiatives. And I'm going to flip it and talk about the connections between racism in its current form and uh, colonialism. And I'm going to borrow from Latin American decolonial thinkers and just say out loud that racism is a linchpin of colonialism. It's part of the structure of colonialism. These scholars from Latin America also argue that capitalism and modernity are the other axes of what they call coloniality. So modernity for them is understood to begin in 1492 with the conquering and colonizing of the Americas by various European nations. And it includes the transatlantic slave trade as well. That's what Walter Mignolo and others call the underside of modernity. This modernity that began in 1492 actually financed the European so-called enlightenment and what we commonly think of as the modern era. So this colonial superstructure, this coloniality is embedded, has embedded in it a structure of white supremacy. So I just wanted to sort of put that out there to begin, um, to begin with. For me, um, I think there's a real danger when we actually don't acknowledge this connection between racism and colonialism. I think it makes it easier to say we've arrived. So we're now an anti-racist church or an anti-racist school or an anti-racist person. And we're, and we've decolonized. We've already arrived there rather than focusing on the continuing energy that's needed to work at becoming anti-racist and to work at commitments and processes of decolonizing. So they're part of the same struggle for me. And they're also part of my own personal commitment, which I'll talk about it a, a bit. Of course, there's a difference in language and focus between anti-racism and decolonial initiatives, but they are inextricably linked. So you can't embark on decolonial initiatives, in my opinion, without coming to terms with the need for anti-racism, because the structures of white supremacy are part of what enabled um, colonialism to wreak havoc in our world over the last 500 years. For someone like me, who um, is white, that means that I have to come to terms with my whiteness with the ways that my culture and society has conditioned me to function in racist ways. So I also wanna put out there, and I'm curious to see what my panelists think, that uh, co-panelists, that anti-racism, um, I think it's possible to focus on anti-racism and not necessarily make a commitment to decolonizing. And, I, and that's a problem. But I just want to put that out there as a dynamic that I think does happen. Um, why is it a mistake? Because then we're not looking at this superstructure that um, that continues to govern the way we live our lives and who has power and privilege and who doesn't. And I mean, it, it's connected to all, all the crises that are going on in the world at the moment. So I'm just going to come back to this, the other part of the question about how anti-racism and decolonial initiatives uh, connect with my fields. And I'm going to use the plural there because I work teaching as a professor of practical ministry, as you heard. Um, but I also lead worship and I also lead music. I'm also a singer and a choir conductor and I do research as a scholar. So I kind of interact with different fields. Because of my own position as a white Anglo scholar, worship leader and professor, I work to constantly interrogate my own motivations. It's a continual process of interrogation. 
I'm constantly uncovering ways in which I still function very much as someone with white privilege and power. And I continually remind myself that this privilege and power was put into place as part of the colonial project. And some of my friends, some of whom are here in the room today, help me with this. They remind me um, and keep me accountable and continue to teach me about the ways that white supremacy has um, is, is, has been um, enculturated into the fabric of who I am and how I behave. So I am. I just want to say how grateful I am for their accompaniment. What are we talking about here? We're talking not just about anti-Black racism, but also racism against Indigenous peoples, against Latinx peoples, against folks who are Asian or Muslim or Jewish. It's all of it. And it's all connected to coloniality. It's all part of a system that was designed to give power to certain people and certain nations, people who look like me. Except perhaps for the gender question, which is also part of the structure of uh, colonialism. This, um, these racisms erase difference. They 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 uh, set up a binary of white and other, and they erase difference even among folks who are of European descent as well, um, and. So it, it lumps people in groups together um, and doesn't account for the, the amazing diversity of ethnocultural backgrounds. So speaking about disciplines, my commitment to anti-racism and decolonizing initiatives impacts what and how I do research. So I'm always self-reflective and self-critical, or I try to be always, I slip up every once in a while. I try to pay attention to identity and context which allow an understanding of how identities, relationships, and social contexts are conditioned by and implicated in the history of colonialism in Canada. So I analyze how coloniality is still at play in all aspects of our living, our being, our doing, including in theology and church practices, and including in research. So part of my commitment to decolonial community-based research includes an awareness of my social location, as well as my privilege as a white English-speaking scholar. So I look for collaboration and seek partners with scholars from diverse cultural and ethnocultural, ethno-racial backgrounds. Their insights and wisdom enrich and challenge me and my work and the academy and broader society. So this, um, these commitments to anti-racism and decolonizing initiatives also influence how I teach. We ask questions like, or I ask questions like, whose work are we reading? Who are the special guests that are coming into the classroom? How do we affirm and lift up the lived experience of those who are in the classroom? These are questions, or you can substitute church for classroom, right? How do we, uh, wh whose voices are we privileging? Who are the people that we're inviting to share leadership with us? How do we affirm the lived experience of those in our communities? They're also similar to the questions I ask in my own research. So I'm just going to wrap up this part of the answer with um, uh, with a shout out to Luke Heisa, who's here today. He is a uh, newly minted UCC minister, originally from Zimbabwe, who's working in Calgary now for the United Church of Canada. And he's um, been asking lots of challenging questions in the class this week, including this one. And I'm going to leave you with this. So this is a focus on the question of language. And, and I have his permission to ask this question too. Um, uh, he asked, if the what's in a name? So we've been looking at the history of the United Church today. We did a hundred years today. What's in a name? If it's the United Church of Canada, why were indigenous people not involved in the shaping of the church from the get-go? So this is a question um, 
that I think that there are lots of complicated answers to the question, but we could ask the same question about other uh, people groups that have been ma marginalized through our church's history, right? If it's the United Church of Canada, of with an emphasis on the word of, how do we live into that calling? Thanks. Thanks so much, Becca. Very helpful. Um, and lots to ponder there. And thank you for leaving us, us with that question. Uh, Nestor, we'll turn to you for your response. In your respective field, how do you understand the connection between anti-racism and decolonial initiatives? And is there a distinction between the two? Thanks, Jennifer. And hi, everybody. Um, you know, uh, at the beginning, we were talking about um, who goes first, right? And usually the person that goes first is the person that feels like, oh, no, this is going to, but at the same time, they get the chance to set the tone of the conversation in many ways. And so I don't, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can add a lot. So I'm just going to try to, you know, make some few comments and hopefully uh, build on on what Becca uh, already uh, brought to us. But I'm an ethicist. I'm an ethicist and a cultural critic. And I look at and come at this question from that perspective. I also come at these uh, questions uh, from the perspective of being Latino, who, who lived uh, in Guatemala many years, who had to leave because uh, his life was threatened. Uh, because of a uh, civil war, and who also ended up in in many other places, arrived to Canada a few years ago, uh, uh, more than a few, and and who has never felt welcome in this country. So I come at this question from that perspective. So from my field of study, um, let me just first say that I'm not coming at it just from the perspective of abstract engagement and academic engagement. Uh, we can do a whole lot of intellectual gymnastics there. But what I'm thinking about is more um, about the question of how we land this thing. And for me, thinking about um, anti-racism and decolonial uh, initiatives is about how we act and live out our faith in ways that are ethically um, honorable or that in ways that we can ethically honor our fellow humans. And that I'm using just as a, as a rubric for everything that I'm about to say. At the end of the day, anti-racism and decolonial thinking invite us to rethink how we relate to other people. At the end of the day, they ask us questions about what were and what are the structures that permit us to build or think about other human beings in ways that are derogatory or discriminatory or in ways that makes them or builds makes them out to be less than human and it is i think there where there is a distinction between anti-racism work and 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 decolonial perspectives I do think that these are not synonymous, but I also think that if I engage in anti-racism work, inevitably I will end up thinking and engaging questions of a decolonial perspective because I will have to engage the question of the colonial legacy, which inevitably will end up in the, in the very obvious issue of racial differences. But I also think that the colonial initiatives add a whole lot more because the part of the colonial legacy is certainly racial, ethno-racial differences. But the colonial legacy also speaks to a larger apparatus of power that is designed to organize reality in a certain way whereby everything is structured hierarch hierarchically and whereby certain value is assigned to a specific populations and a specific places, so much so that all of the other populations of the world are structured with a, an assigned a specific value 
within that specific value system. And on top of that, then we have whiteness. And I think that's where I connect a little bit with, with what Becca was saying about white supremacy. Although I would argue that, that in an anti-racism work, the, 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 the superstructure is white supremacy. But in, in, in decolonial initiatives, the superstructure that we're talking about is the organization of the world in a way that follows a specific arbitrary value system that invites us to think about the world in this and only this value system. And that is, I think, where I feel the connection, but also I feel the, the, the disconnection. So it is true that sometimes when people engage in anti-racism work, sometimes they don't move beyond uh, the anti-racism work and forget about the whole structure and or value system that we have inherited from the colonial legacy. Going a little bit further with that, and I also think that one of the things that often gets ignored and gets sidestepped um, in anti-racism work often refers to phenotypical uh, characteristics, color of the skin. Uh, we, we talk about um, the specific features of a person and, and, and that's how many people are often um, organized and structured around. Asians, Africans, Afri African Canadians, Latino, Latina, or, um, and so on and so forth. But one of the key aspects, I think, that the colonial legacy has managed to ensconce or hide away from all of these analyses is that our experiences are embodied. And that when we are engaged in anti-racism work, the racial, the experience of being discriminated against, whether be whether because of race or because of, of class or because of nationality or whatever it is, that is also experienced in our bodies. And so, so to talk about the colonial legacy also requires that we think through how it is that our bodies are involved in that engagement. Not only because, of course, the indigenous communities ended up being decimated and also because of Afro-descendants ended up being enslaved. But even today, a whole lot of populations are still continue, are still being exploited, like the seasoned workers that, that pick our grocery, our, our produce, and so on and so forth. So it is important to think about the colonial legacy as a larger umbrella within which uh, racism, racism takes place as well. Anyway, I'm not sure if I've added a lot or any to what Becca has already said, but I'll just uh, be quiet for now. And I think Amy will come and talk to us as well. Thank you for now. Thanks so much, Nestor. And yes, welcome, Amy. And the same question. Um, how do you understand the connections between anti-racism and decolonization initiatives? And is there a distinction? Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, hi, everyone. Good evening, um, wherever you're joining from, or good afternoon. Good day. <laughs> um, I am uh, just want to start my comments by saying that um, I am joining you from uh, Calgary, the land that the uh, Blackfoot called Mokinsis. I literally live at Mokinsis, where the two rivers join. Um, it's a stone's throw from my home, and I feel grateful to live here. Uh, this is uh, the region of Treaty 7 and Métis Region 3 um, in Calgary. And Luke, by the way, who was brought up uh, by Becca, sounds like someone I should meet since we're in the same city. So I'll look forward to that in the future. Um, I also just want to send uh, my regards to Al Crease, who I know from the anti-racism common table. Um, her um, misfortune is my good fortune because I get to be here uh, tonight. Um, and uh, I was a last minute roster shift. So I hope that I can add some valuable comments 
uh, to the discussion this evening. Um, I have a library book that's very, very late. Uh, I have to take it back, but uh, it's timely that it's sitting on my table, uh, ready to go back. It's a book by a woman named Marie Batiste, who wrote a book called Decolonizing Education. I think there's some valuable insights uh, to our theological discussion there. And so I would just start uh, with a quote from her, um, where she says uh, that Canadian society has failed to rid itself of the founding construction of racism wrapped in colonialism and Eurocentrism. It remains the deep structure of Canadian thought and context. She goes on that tolerance of covert and systemic discrimination and sanctions and sanitized actions and words uh, damage, she says, the Aboriginal spirit, but I would extend it to the spirit of all whom are racialized. Um, so my comments uh, can only come through my own eyes and experiences, and I am a Black biracial uh, woman. I um, only know my own experiences uh, of, of racism, but it is a something that I study a lot and work on a lot uh, for the good of the church and, and for my own liberation, healing and freedom. And so I think that personally, you know, the, the places that I draw from are influenced by a, a vast multiplicity of theologies and also disciplines. And I think both commenters tonight have really touched on that area of connection. Um, a wonderful book has been written by uh, a man who in my, my head is my best friend, Willie James Jennings. Uh, the book is called After Whiteness and Education and Belonging. And how he opens the book is talking about working in fragments. And um, I'm sure we've all had the experience of reading a book or seeing a film or a piece of art where someone says or expresses something so deeply that it's as if you had written it yourself and it validates you and brings you to life in a very uh, visceral way. And um, that book did that for me. And I'm so grateful that it was written. I think that, uh, some of the places that have influenced my take on this are womanist theologies, uh, black theologies, liberation theology, um, indigenous theologies, and others. I think that the gospel itself is inherently anti-racist, um, but let those who have eyes to see uh, know that. And so I think it's important that these type of theologies that I just named are brought to the forefront of our own understanding in the United Church of Canada, because there's something uh, in academics called the hermeneutic of the uh, poor or the hermeneutic of the oppressed. And I think that that understanding, the telling of gospels in our of the gospel in our own stories, through our own experience of a God who makes a way out of no way, is clarifying and, um, and relevant and important and urgent. Uh, for the Eurocentric church to hear. Um, it is a different way of approaching the gospel um, that doesn't rely on systems of hierarchy, which have been alluded to, those of capitalism, uh, whiteness, power, uh, and how we approach power. So I think that for me, um, in my work so far as a student and as an aspiring future academic, storytelling is central and key. Um, it's vitally important because it democratizes um, access to theology. Um, we can understand through womanist theology, the theology uh, present in a woman like myself, who single parents, who makes sure my children are safe, who actively works to break generational curses, who actively seeks to heal my own trauma so that that trauma does not carry on generation after generation after generation. Um, Groundedness, uh, Nestor uh, brilliantly mentioned the body is so vitally important to me because our trauma lives there. And so I think part of uh, how I certainly try to engage uh, my work um, as a student, as um, a speaker, as a leader, as a, someone who preaches from the pulpit, is to be trauma informed and to teach others what that means. Um, the way we use language and the way we express our ideas lands on certain bodies in ways that we might not imagine if we don't have the experience of being traumatized. Um, I do think that we are presently wrestling in our church 
with uh, compulsory cultural whiteness. And we see that in the way uh, that, uh, as Nestor said, the value systems that we um, inherently place above others. And I think we've done good work in trying to break that down. And I do think there's work yet to be done. Um, I think when we draw from these different traditions and with a focus on healing, a focus on pleasure and joy and uh, selfhood um, that is full and rich and deep and abundant, as it says in John 10, 10, I have come so that you may live life abundantly, um, not of a stripped self uh, or, or a self that is uh, subhuman or less than or othered or racialized, but so that you and you and you and me may live life abundantly. When we come at it from that perspective, I think we're able to simultaneously heal our own wounds, to be uh, wounded healers who lead from our healed scars rather than from our wounds. And I also think we are able to cast a vision, uh, which to me is of ultimate importance, uh, particularly thinking of um, the homiletic tradition. A vision has to be cast so that the people that can hear um, are moved, not only uh, by you know uh, study and books, which we're very good at in our United Church, and I, I love that about us, but emotionally, uh, viscerally moved to enact a vision of uh, God's good kingdom here on earth. And uh, I'm excited and honored to have even uh, the smallest role in that um, undertaking. And so I'll stop there for now, um, because I think my my fellow panelists named a lot of the things that I had uh, wanted to discuss as well. So thanks. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, I'm just going to draw out a few of the themes that I think that I heard with the three of you and invite you um, all to just have some conversation amongst the three of you about some of those themes. So, and I, what I want to start with is the theme of being embodied, but Amy, what you just said about pleasure and joy and selfhood, because I think that's um, like rich and abundant selfhood, that the the vision of that is, is what the hope and the work of anti-racism and decolonization is really about. And so I appreciate you naming that because I think we often um, neglect that. So we want to hold that as kind of the, the bucket in which we have this conversation. What are the ways in which pleasure and joy and this rich, abundant life together can be kind of manifest. Um, I think each of you touched on the superstructures of colonization, uh, naming that in different ways and that anti-racism becomes a manifestation of colonization. Um, and there's significant differences that we need to attend to in those two uh, ways of understanding how the how the world is structured, how power and privilege uh, are arranged, and the impact, the different impact on different bodies of those two structures. So I I think what I want to do is just invite the three of you to have a bit of conversation about those linkages that you've named in different ways and where you you yourself have heard some of the similarities and perhaps some of the differences in what you're saying. So, so who goes first? <laughs> That's too funny. Uh, all right. <laughs> I, um, I'm, I'm going to try to go just for two, two, two key things. Um, I mean, I'm sure. I, I, I definitely want to take um, pleasure and joy. I, I, I really do. Um, and, and this may just very well be my own experience, background, and exp and, and, and things that I've gone through. Um, but I think that before I do that, I I also want to um, affirm uh, and acknowledge uh, the pain, uh, the suffering, uh, the the fact that uh, a lot of our people in the context of Canada continue to be crucified because of who they are, and 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 I think it's important to to not to move too quickly to, for me at least to the question of pleasure and joy, uh, unless I have already uh, allowed those those voices that suffer to speak and to speak your truth and to also educate us in terms of 
where uh, our very system, where our very churches, where our very ideas of theology are, are failing and, and contributing to the suffering of others. So that is, for me, um, a, a critical move. Uh, because much of that pain is is psychological, is actually uh, really embodied. People get sick because don't people don't sleep. People uh, walk around with fear. People so all those are embodied realities that I think uh, need to be recognized and acknowledged in the various different contexts of our churches. And and the other. One that I want to touch on, that I, you know, I mentioned the 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 superstructure, and 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 Amy kind of brought it back to me when she said Eurocentrism, and 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 I went, yeah, sorry, I forgot to say that. So so, <laughs> thank you for saying that. But um, what I find important though is is to recognize that our entire social and cultural structure of Canada revolves around the idea there is a single strand of knowledge that it is the one that is credible and that is the one that we find in our churches that's the one we find in our institutions of education that's the one we find in our social institutions of healthcare, and so on and so forth so to or to think about a superstructure and dismantling that superstructure also requires that we begin to imagine the possibilities that there are other places where there is knowledge, that there is other places where we can find other ideas about health, that there are other places where we can find other ideas about being human being, uh, and so on and so forth. And I mean, uh, my goodness, in, in my context of Latin America, we talk about buen vivir and senti pensar. Let me translate those for you. Um, uh, buen vivir, living, uh, good living. It's, it's, it's not about living well. And that, by that, I mean that thinking about it in, in, in terms of, of wealth and, and abundance, but rather ensuring that every member of our community is able to have what they need. And that when we have what they need, seven generations later, they still will be able to, to, to think about that. So that, that's, so there are other sources of knowledge that this one strand of Eurocentric perspective prevents us from appreciating and learning from. Anyway, so those are, yeah, I'll, I won't say anything else anymore. Okay. If I may, I just wanted to respond to, to Nestor's distinction between the container and the holding of pain and lament um, and the, the suggestion that I made around joy and pleasure and selfhood. Um, certainly, I don't uh, want the comments that I made to be construed as a sidestep. For me, it's impossible. I am one of those people who is crucified as I walk this path of call. Um, and uh, it would be it would be a lie uh, to my and a betrayal of myself and my ancestors to say otherwise. So that's certainly not what I'm saying. What I am saying, I think, just to clarify, is that that can be held in one hand and be fully true. And in the other hand, I can only survive and find my good living, as you call it, uh, if I am uh, vigilant for blessing and uh, loud and exuberant when I see those blessings. Um, you know, I think of the tradition of the, the black church, which uh, holds so much uh, to music and to preaching. And I think, what what strikes me about that tradition in particular is is that it comes out of a long tradition of not knowing whether you would be in the church next Sunday. You could die. You could be sold away. Your children could be taken from you. So the the celebration and the pleasure and the joy is triumphant in the midst of the tears and the sadness and the aching because it might just let you live another week. So that's the way I think about it. And certainly, I don't suggest we skip to Easter and forget about Saturday. Uh, that's that's far from my own personal theological viewpoint. So just to clarify. And I'll just add like that I was the one who shortened, Amy, what you had said, because you also said that in the context of reflecting on generational trauma and trauma in our bodies and the need to heal. So, yeah, thank you.
I I want to hear in both Nestor and Amy's words um, a call to receive a gentle and loving rebuke. Not 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 necessarily against what I said today, but what I might say um, as somebody who wants to be in solidarity with racialized people who has made a commitment to anti-racism work and decolonizing, but who messes up on a regular basis. Um, and here's here, here's where this conversation took me. It took me to two places. One is um, the need to listen. So to listen and hear uh, stories of pain and suffering, as well as uh, stories of celebration and resistance and and uh, um, exuberance, to hear all of that without uh, interpreting it through my own lens as a white person. So I hear that as one piece of it, and I think that's really crucial. And then the other is, if I can remember, hmm, I might forget. Um, the second part of the rebuke is that I know that I, I'm a compassionate person and it troubles me deeply. It troubles me to my core when I hear stories of pain and suffering and I have an impulse to want to fix it. And this is a very white response to uh, to hearing the suffering of people who are racialized or marginalized in other ways. And uh, I don't like sitting in the discomfort um, and I want to make things better. Um, and I, I don't think that that's a bad impulse in me, um, but when it tries to bypass the stories that I'm hearing from my friends and colleagues, then it becomes problematic uh, because I don't think that we can dive deep into the work of anti-racism unless we really come to terms with how it has harmed people's bodies and lives. And, uh, you know, that that's a, 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 a painful story to make to listen to, but it's far more painful to live. So people like me need to shut up and listen and bear witness to um, to the story that we're hearing, the stories. Thank you everybody for uh, engaging in, in that uh, follow-up. Um, just looking at our time, were there any shorter kind of remarks that others now want to, Amy or Nestor want to make in response, Amy? Yeah, I just want to comment on Becca's uh, saying about that impulse to fix. I think it is really important to point that out. And I think it's sometimes counterintuitive um, that we have to slow down to go fast because we do want to do this work and we don't want people to suffer any longer than they must. Um, and so one of the things that is said again and again in the anti-racism common table as we engage in that work to remind ourselves of that is that uh, this is generational work. Um, this is work that we um, engage in in good faith, you know, uh, much like building a cathedral that we'll never stand in. Um, but we do it with hopeful hearts so that those who can stand in the beautiful cathedral that we hopefully build uh, will 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 honor us as good ancestors. Jennifer, can I just say that I really, Amy, I really appreciate what you just said. And what I need to remind myself of is to be patient, that this work will not be completed in my lifetime as much as I would desire it, but that those generations that we're building towards a future of uh, generational healing. So thank thanks for saying that. That's for uh, you unmuted. Did you? Oh, sorry. No, I'm, 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 I'm just going to check that the time um are we gonna go to the other question or uh, so i'd rather go to the other question and then yeah. okay yeah we'll move to the second question and we're going to uh reverse the order so we'll hear from amy then nestor then becca um and so and i think we've started to move into some of the second question but it is how can the church be engaged in anti anti-racism and decolonial work concretely so to pick up on nestor's phrase how do we land this thing? What are some of the ways, there's multiple ways, but what are some of the ways that um, you see 
this happening concretely in the church or that you dream of that we want to be about. So we'll turn back to Amy. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I, I give a, a warning that that my answers might not feel very good. Um, so just, uh, okay, uh, let's do it together. Um, I want to just quickly say something about patterns that I see in the things that we're speaking about in the work that we're doing in my own body and my own reality right now, um, as I'm dealing with my own burnout and, um, and uh, destabilization. And I think it has to be said that we have gone full steam ahead on some of these systems that we talked about, that we all collectively got a glimpse of how they weren't working during COVID. I feel like at the very beginning of COVID, when we were all watching birds and uh, loving our families before we were doing endless Zoom meetings, there was a, just a crack of, oh, wow, this doesn't work for any of us, including those who get to be in the group of white, um, which I may add ever extends its boundaries to consolidate power. So um, that's a footnote, though. Uh, I think the opportunity that's presented as we face what is often called this church decline, um, there are opportunities to lean into that deeply and allow some of those stones to fall. Um, unfortunately, because those stones are people's jobs sometimes or benefits or ways of thinking that are entrenched as being correct ways of thinking, uh, there is a a real um, death grip to some of those patterns and ways of being. Um, now, I say this as somebody who is in the unique position of having had a conversion experience and ending up in a mainline church. That's not usual. Uh, but I don't have that same uh, sentimental connection to growing up in the church and the good old days. And, you know, that that's not part of my being. And I acknowledge that. So I don't say these things to be insensitive to folks who are deeply grieving loss. But I ask the question in earnest that is some of that loss, is some of that grieving around power, privilege, and the way things always were, which weren't so good for many other people. And so I think um, there's a call in my heart, you know, to those who will uh, be midwives for the church. Some will be midwives of death and they will do wonderful pastoral work with the folks who need it. Others will be midwives who pull the screaming baby from the womb and bless it. And um, I think it's important for us each in our own ways to do that kind of discernment for ourselves and to ask ourselves, what are we willing to let go of so that the baby can come? Um, I've given birth twice. So that metaphor is really deep and rich to me. Um, I've, uh, I've, I've been in a place of fear uh, and the baby won't come when you're scared. You have to let go. So I really do um, offer that metaphor with my full heart. and. Um, I think concretely, um, some of our, our, as Nestor alluded to, we have to accept other ways of knowing. Um, there are, there's a big movement right now in terms of uh, the academy exploring questions of knowledge equity and how um, different ways of having, whether that's embodied knowledge or in, uh, knowledge from other professions, how that might strengthen our ministry and perhaps offer um, real medicine and gifts to the church. Um, but we do seem to be attached in some ways to, to our traditional ways of education and putting those first. And not that they don't have value and importance, um, but is there a way to marry and to, to think about hybridity? I think hybridity is also a very important theme um, as we think about these questions. Um, and as a person who has lived in hybridity in multiple ways, um, I think I, I, I have a lot to, uh, to offer on that topic, but I don't want to overspeak or take too much time. So I will leave it there um, and, and see what the co-panelists have to say. 
Thanks, Amy. Over to co-pilot Nestor. That's funny. Um, you know, having been here, having come from a Pentecostal background, uh, where things are really very different, and 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 coming into the United Church, um, and 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 explore its history, its rich history. I think there are a couple of things that are on the way. Um, one of which is the church itself is going through us a real rough patch uh, because it seems to have problems with its own identity, where it's headed and how it's going to get there. And, and though it's done a great deal of work in terms of determining itself to be uh, an intercultural church, for example, uh, sometimes it, it seems that it's having a little bit of problem uh, deciding what interculturalism means and how to get that done. Um, but what I see also is that one of the things that predominates in, in the church is the it is this uh, understanding of Christianity that is still deeply uh, from a Western European Anglo North Atlantic perspective, and that it needs to be decentered in other for other perspectives of of Christianity, understandings of Christianity from other cultural groups to play a, an important factors factor in that. But let me just give you some. Some concrete ones, because I think uh, at the end of the day, I really like to land this thing. Uh, um, and so um, one is is uh, your places of worship. Maybe you want to rethink about how your places of worship reflect or are welcoming spaces for people from other cultural groups. I would also encourage the church to go beyond the idea of uh, anti-racism work as just anti-indigenous, anti-black, or anti-Jewish, and broaden it up and realize that there is a host of people who are experiencing racism and discrimination and who also have suffered under the colonial um, uh, um, rule of colonial legacy. And so it's important to broaden it up so that we have a, a, a broader conversation of what anti-racism work means and also the colonial initiatives. Please, please, please have food, but don't limit your work to just having food from other cultural groups. I mean, it's delicious. I'm telling you, if you have food, I'll be there. But I, I also know that that if you don't open up the conversation to understand why those kinds of foods are the way they are, what's the history behind those foods, and what are the cultural traditions to which that they represent, then we're missing the point. I mean, other than we're having good food. And 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 also please change your hymnody. There's a whole lot of your Hymnody, but it is deeply, deeply irrelevant now. And I know I'm being, I'm scared because I'm probably going to be lynched. But and I, I say, I say, irrelevant because because people from other cultural groups can't plug themselves in there. And if you have songs, try to bring them in, incorporate people from other cultural groups in those songs and those celebrations, because then your church will be transformed in ways that you cannot imagine. And then my last thing is then, as a result of that, be open to change. Be open to your church. Be transformed by the sheer presence of people who are just not like you. You and when and I you I mean people who are from from a white Anglo white Euro Canadian context. Anyway, I think I already got myself into hot water, so I think I better don't say any more so that the water's cooled down. Thanks so much, Nestor. We may ask you to sing a hymn at the end or something. Yeah, that's right. I think uh, one of the areas of my scholarship is in singing, so I'm like, oh man, he's taking my. <laughs> Um, so I, 
I think in terms of landing thing, I'd like to kind of talk about worship and what we do as a church when we gather in community and suggest that there are different ways of decolonizing and um, in, in what we do in worship. So Nestor uh, talked about uh, affirming songs and I would add prayers and biblical inter interpretation and preaching from the global South and from marginalized communities in the global North. So how do we, that's the uh, a number one priority. How do we affirm that? But not in a superficial way, right? Not like this is Black History Month or this is National Indigenous Day, but how do we build that into the fabric of our communities? How do we let it change who we are, change our identity? So that would be one. Um, and I think a lot about music and hymnody. Um, and so in thinking about that, there's two other ways that I think that actually happens. One of the ways, and this, this has been challenging for me, is that marginalized communities will often take a hymn that I might say is colonial in its theology, its language, its music, and they'll flip it on its head and it'll become a song of resistance. Um, so for instance, a hymn like um, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. I find it it's not my favorite hymn. I'll just say that out loud. And uh, and I'm now getting myself into hot water, but all the lovers of that hymn, but it's it's got a kind of atonement theology in it and it's uh, overly pietistic. And it, 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 that's, that was my interpretation of it, which got transformed at a, at a makeshift funeral service at my house in the 1980s uh, where my friend, my South African, Black South African friends, we were coming together to remember his mother who had died, and he couldn't go home to South Africa. So what happened was, uh, we we said some prayers, um, and it was the exiled South African community came to my white family's home, and had this service. And um, at the end, uh, one of the leaders said, let's sing a song that is known all over the world. And I thought for some reason we were going to sing Amazing Grace, but we sang What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And here was this hymn utterly transformed and my own experience of it. It became a hymn of resistance, a, a hymn affirming struggle, a hymn um, affirming human dignity. And I... Um, uh, sat back and allowed myself, uh, it, I mean, it's it's actually, it was an experience that I continued to digest for many years. What does it mean for me to allow that to be reconfigured for me? Um, and then the third kind of decolonizing that I think is necessary in, in worship is to look at the all the parts of worship, and I'm going to connect this to, to go beyond worship in a minute, but is to look at the ways that empire is still active. So in the text we sing, in the way we sing, in the instruments we use, in how we move or don't move in service, are we embodied or are we disembodied? Um, all of those things. And, and then beyond that, so is the language military or triumphalistic or about victory and conquering? Is it, does it talk about darkness and lightness? Is it inclusive language? Like all, thinking about language, but also thinking about the how and the who, who is offering leadership? Are we inviting, as Nestor said, stealing my thunder, people who were leading from from other ethno-racial communities to partner with us if we're white or to 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 offer leadership without us to make space by stepping back and being quiet right so all of those things and it's not just our songs it's our prayers it's our preaching it's the way we move in in the church and crucially it's how we take what we do on a sunday morning or another time out into the world how do we live this so how do we live um, our relationships that we're building and allow them to convert us. I'm going to go beyond change and transformation to conversion. So how do, so speaking to those of you who are um, of European descent here and who are white, how do we allow ourselves to be converted? What we need to give some stuff up, right? And I, I really appreciate uh, Amy that you talked about grief. There is grief in that. 
But um, I'm remembering a conversation that erupted actually at my doctoral defense where um, Naomi Deanda said, yes, but what about the other grief? What about the grief of those who have never been present, whose voices are erased, who are not there? So when when I struggle with the grief, and I have experienced um, uh, grief, the grief of having to give something up, being forced to give something up, when that happens to me, how do I remember uh, that that is a fraction of the pain that somebody else experiences by being excluded from the power and privilege that I have as a white person every day, right? So I think I should stop. Um, I, I, I had some comments about relationship, like relationship is key. And both Amy and Nestor have talked about that. So the relationship um honoring who people are and being accountable in relationship. Like I wouldn't be here in this conversation today if it weren't for racialized friends and colleagues who despite um, their own struggles and circumstances have actually accompanied me in my journey. Um, and that is a, an incredible witness of hope and generosity um, that that I just wanna lift up so that, that relationships are where it starts. Thanks uh, so much, Becca, Nestor, and Amy. Um, I think, Amy, you had one thing you wanted to add. Yeah, just to maybe put a bow on that if possible, and it's not even my words that I offer, although I agree with them. Um, I, I was in a meeting um, recently with our moderator, uh, Carmen Lansdowne, and um, she said it very succinctly. Um, a lot of our churches we have on a sign, all are welcome. Um, but what do we actually mean by that? There is a very big difference from being sort of typically uh, Euro European nice. You know, I'll be nice to you. I'll ask you questions. I'll, you know, kind of bombard you with my friendliness. Um, and uh, that is one way to welcome but sometimes uh, what we don't do is think about a welcome that is a space that is created with you in mind. And I think Becca and Nestor both gave very concrete examples of how we might think about doing that. Um, but what is what is welcome and how do we display our welcome, I think, is a really um, clarifying question for folks to consider. And thanks to all three of you for identifying some really concrete ways that we can uh, continue to work at landing this thing. Um, so for those who are participating in this uh, webinar, we have opportunity for you to ask questions and make comments in the chat. So I'm going to take a little bit of time now to do a little bit of a summary. It's going to probably won't catch everything that's there. And then we'll have a chance um, when there are some questions posed in the chat for Becca, Nestor, and Amy to respond to them. So someone was noting um, the uh, challenge really of a kind of this desire to be productive and efficient and uh, that often gets in the way of the relational work that the three of you have talked about and someone else has named that often that's actually a marker of white whiteness and white supremacy and I think uh, would add to that that kind of false sense of urgency that we have to do this now that it then in fact this work Yes, there's an immediacy to it, and it's generational, seven generational. Um, and someone else is noting that the link of anti-racism and decolonization could be approached from the independence of deep solidarity for liberation, which is common ground as God's creation. Um, and someone else is saying we, we need to like physically be present, showing up, doing the work, building relationships with people, not just on Sunday morning or during volunteering, but through the rest of the week, the life of the church, um, that we have to be willing to kind of pay some of the cost of doing the work. And I think, Becca, you alluded to that in terms of grief, what we might give up, but what what does that giving up open space for? Um, and then someone's noting that when Japan colonized Korea, uh, in Asia, they use the ideology of anti-white racism. So Asian people should be colonized under Japanese imperialism against white racial European colonialism. 
also people noting the need for visuals, the songs that we sing, the language within those songs. So just re reaffirming what you all have said um, and also wanting to expand um, the, the welcome and the openness to people who are neuro neurodiverse and those with disabilities. Also the images that are, are often present in many of our churches of the white, blonde, blue-eyed Jesus. <laughs> and so that again goes back to what what are the invisible to, to not invisible, what are the ways that we don't even look at the space of our church building to look at how we might change the physical space to be to be a sign that um people of diverse identities really are welcome. I'll, I mean, that's my interpretation. Um, okay, so that, oh, and then a question. When reading the Old Testament, there are many passages that uh, are challenging and might appear that God is racist. So how do we talk about those passages? <laughs> that's a quick snapshot of some of the comments and questions that are there. So I'll turn it back to the three of you. Um, Brian, I wonder if we might have the three together on the screen and have some conversation and there's still opportunity for people to add in um, more questions and comments in the chat. Just to pick up quickly um, on the idea of um, depictions of Jesus, I think that art is a really powerful way to communicate with congregations. Um, it's something that I use personally uh, quite often. Um, and to challenge, you know, those um, depictions of who I call Nordic Jesus or um, surfer Jesus, depending on the day. Uh, but I do think that, you know, who we say Jesus is, is offering a story. And that story, uh, you know, is meaning making for folks. So I think when we can see um, Jesus from a multiplicity, not necessarily trying to figure out what did historical Jesus look like, but when we can see Jesus spiritually represented uh, through the eyes of all those who worship around the world, um, it can create a new uh, path of meaning making uh, for folks. So I think that is an important one. Um, and, and I just encourage people, there's so many amazing artists, uh, I won't name them all here, but uh, there's plenty that are, are doing fa fabulous work in that arena. I want to say something, but I'm hesitant to say so. Let me, let me try to see whether I can do it well. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, reading the Old Testament, um, uh, uh, I think we need to make a distinction between uh, racism as it is understood today uh, and and ethnic, cultural, and religious differences as they appear in the Old Testament. I think we have to be very careful not to project our own uh, uh, 21st century understandings onto the biblical text. There are there are millennia that separates us between those texts and and today. So so that's one. Um, in 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 the biblical text, many of the differences are primarily of a religious nature, and so the worship of Yahweh is the primary center of, of ethical and moral behavior for the people of Israel. It's not a particularly uh, a, a, an ethno-racially or much less even biologically, because as you, as you probably know, uh, there were people who were from other ethnic cultural groups that were welcome to become Jews if they went through the process of either being circumcised or adopted the practice. We see this in people like Ruth and a number of other, uh, but Tamar, I mean, so, so I think, it, Hagar, sorry, I think there are, it's important for us to make a distinction along those lines. Um, just, just two days ago, I was reading, ironically, Second Kings, where where the king of the Assyrians is said, and this is Second Kings chapter six and seven. The king of the Assyrians had defeated their enemies, and it says, and God liberate them so that they could defeat their enemies. So I go, whoa, that's a very interesting statement. 
because it says the purpose of the author then is to show that God was uh, was in control. While God was invested not only on the Jews, but also on the Hebrews, to be more precise, but also on all the peoples from from the world. And so I think it's, it's very important for us to to evaluate our own uh, our own assumptions with which we come to the text that may just lead us into a different direction that might just not jive with the actual content in the passage. Anyway, that's all. If I may, on that note, uh, Nestor, I think um, it might be important to go back to the beginning of the conversation and just say very explicitly um, for the folks that race is a socially constructed idea. There is no biological reality in race or racism. Certainly the consequences of the, the creation of racial categorizations live with us today. And the people who find themselves to be racialized people uh, face real racism. But race in and of itself is not a real Phenomena. So I think that's really important just to tack on to the end of your comments around your wow. and certainly was not a phenomenon that existed in, in ancient Israel. Right. So so if I can just tag on the, <laughs> that one, <laughs> this is too funny. Um, may I just also say that it is a social construct, but it is a colonial construct. It, 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 the, the, the discrimination of groups on the basis of race was part of the larger colonial project in the process of organizing groups hierarchically, whereby all the others were racist except the white people. So, I, I, so it's, it's important to, to also tag on to that, but point well taken. It is a social construct. It is also a colonial construct. Thank you, uh, Amy, for that. Can I just go in a slightly different direction? Um, I'm looking at some of the comments here, and I'm thinking about um, uh, what this means for us as, as people and what this means for us as Christians uh, to make a commitment to anti-racism. I'm really appreciating... Uh, and to connect it, I'm, I'm, I've seen a couple of comments about language around uh, ability and disability, and I want to lift that up. I want to lift up the fact that a struggle um, for anti-racism can also be a struggle in solidarity with people who are disabled, right? So, so that there's, so that there are connections here, um, not to water down any struggle, but to build solidarity there. Um, the and I'm a pre, I'm just going to go back in the comments here to uh, uh, to Carmen Comrie's comment about um, silence and the lack of um, uh, the how silence can be complicity and um, I think that that uh, is a really important um, thing to come back to and to say to so when I ask what does it mean for us as humans as people who are who are not different biologically um, but who are racialized according to this social construct so what does it mean for us to make a commitment to anti-racism work and what does it mean for us as christians to do that and so i i want to connect those and just say that for me as a christian the my call to being a Christian disallows that complicity and that silence. I don't I read that my identity as a Christian as requiring me to work on anti-racism and, and decolonizing. Do I fail? Oh yeah, all the time. But um I I and so I just I, I want to sort of ask us all what does it mean as a Christian to do that and I think it really means rejecting silence in the face of incidents and confrontations where racism is at play um, and again to just say that for me as a white person yeah I can be silent I have that privilege right but to but as a Christian I don't 
I feel like being silent in the face of that kind of, um, of, of witnessing some sort of discrimination is antithetical to who I'm called to be as a Christian. It doesn't allow me to love my neighbor as myself, right? So if we're really going to be serious about this, then we can't be silent. Um, okay. <laughs> that's, that's my, I don't know, Jennifer, if there's other questions that are coming up that, um, or where you want to take us or. I haven't I just add on to what you said, if it's okay, um, Becca, about the silence piece and um, Carmen's comment. Um, I think even one step further is um, just taking apart silence because there is a time for silence and deep listening and believing yes. those who are telling you uh, what is happening um, because the other side of that silence and not doing anything is the uh, the gaslighting and uh, the 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 well they didn't mean it that way or or the justifying of. Um, not only racist incidents, but also um, how the systems play out racism. So I, I would just uh, even add a, a bit more there. Also along the lines of silence, I'll, I'll try to go in the opposite direction, if that's okay. Um, you know, as a racialized individual who has been arrested and who has been prevented from getting on airport, on planes, and, and, and a whole lot of other things. Sometimes it's good to be to, to exercise silence. And 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 I think it is important to recognize that as a person that to recognize the power differential. Sometimes in a situation that is heightened with discrimination and stuff, a person who is racialized might choose to be quiet because they just simply feel unsafe. And it is important to recognize and not expect them, well, you should be speaking against racism. You should be doing it. Uh, and, and that is a, a paternalistic a way of looking at the situation. So, so I think on one hand, it's important to speak for and be prophetic about it. But on the other hand, it's also about being sensitive to, the, to what is happening and also see how many instances for racialized people, sometimes the best thing is not to say anything because that may just exacerbate the situation. I wonder, um, Nestor, if... Even like just imagining some scenario, uh, if uh, if a, a white person was to speak up, sometimes they might actually be putting somebody in danger as well. Like so, there's a way in which uh, speaking up doesn't mean speaking for, right? Like it's not about um, uh, taking away somebody's agency. So there, there's a there's a constant need for a relationship, even in the moment of, of conflict or violence, right? So that, so that, um, so that a, a very real um, physical or emotional or spiritual threat uh, can be recognized, and um, and and that the person who is threatened is the one who gets to call the shots. Thank you, the three of you. I am. Um... There's a lot of richness in the conversations that you've been having and that participants have been engaging in through the chat. So thank you very much uh, to each of you for that, um, particularly to give to give the kind of overview, the structure, like how colonialism really functions and how anti-racism is a tool of that effectively. And then some concrete ways that we can engage with this work um, in our communities of faith and in our own lives. I, would like to just turn it back again to the three of you, if you have a last closing comment from each of you, and then I'll turn it back to Adele. Becca, you're on screen. Do you want to go first or should I ask someone else? I think I'm, I, I feel like I've said enough actually. So I'll just, I'll just um, turn it over to my colleagues. I thought we were going to change the order, so I would be the first one this time around. <laughs> Funny. <laughs>
<laughs> no, it doesn't mean that I'm volunteering, but let me, let me just <laughs> let me just say this. Colonialism is insidious. Colonialism creeps in in our very fibers to the degree that it impacts the way we think, the way we imagine things, even our taste buds, the way we feel everything, it changes. For the church to move in the direction of decolonization, the church is required to unlearn aspects that it has held dear to for decades, sometimes even centuries. So it is important uh, that when we're thinking about anti-racism work um, and decolonial initiatives, uh, we don't think of it in terms of goals. When we get there, we're going to be ready. <laughs> I think Amy and Becca already helped us out to, to realize that this is not going to happen anytime soon. But to also realize that all of us have the potential of reproducing colonialism. All of us. And that whether we are racialized or whether we're Euro Canadians, all of us somehow have been infected by that insidious bug that is racism and that is also colonialism. So keeping that in mind can help us have a little bit of humility in opening ourselves to the life, existence, and the experience of another. And it sounds like a preaching, isn't it? Anyway, that's all I'll say. Nothing wrong with preaching. Um, <laughs> uh, I wanted to just um, make a couple of comments. Um, one, just based on what Nestor just said regarding internalized racism. Um, that is a real uh, thing. And so it's important, you know, as we actually talked about today uh, at the anti-racism common table meeting, to remember that just because you've spoken to an indigenous person or a black person or a Latin person uh, or a Korean person, you have not now understood the totality of thought of feeling, um, you don't necessarily know the level to which that person is expressing ideas based on their own internalized racism, their own struggle, their own trauma. So I think that's a really important point that you made, Nasura, about all of us uh, having grace for one another in this project of decolonization, because it is a, a season of deep healing. And then I just wanted to uh, make a comment because, as as we noted, there was comments around neurodiversity, about disability, and others. Um, certainly, I'm sure many of the folks here have an understanding of intersectionality. And so um, it is important that in these conversations focused on anti-racism or decolonization, that we do uh, hold those up as 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 the topic. And yes, there is life and there is reality in those other things. I myself have a multiplicity of intersectionalities that I won't get into at the end of the thing, but um, some of them I can hide and some of them I can't. And certainly my race and my racialization is one that immediately um, uh, experiences judgment uh, and categorization. Um, so I, I, I just want to honor those who have spoken about that and also uh, remind folks that when we have these conversations about anti-racism and decolonization, that we, we can hold space for that and also hold space for other things. And sometimes it's okay to just hold space for the one thing and allow that thing to shut, to, to hold uh, the space and the importance in the moment. It doesn't mean we've forgotten about other things. It doesn't mean that uh, those things aren't as important. Um, and all of those intersectionalities, whether it's ability, age, race, gender, sexual uh, um, identity, um, are, are, are held hostage 
by a colonial project. So the, those are those are all we recognize that, and I think that um, it's good to bring it up and kind of uh, flesh it out a bit. So thanks uh, for all the good comments. Thank you again to Nestor and Amy and Becca for your your embodied passion, your wisdom, your insights, your challenges uh, and questions to us as a church and to uh, the ways in which I think you've helped unpack some of the realities of colonialism within the church and racism within the church and the structures of that um, and the, the offerings of some of the ways that we can continue to engage in the work faithfully and plant some seeds that will grow for a future generation. So thank you again. And uh, I'll turn this over to Adele. Great. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you again to Amy and to Nestor and for Becca, to Becca for such an engaging conversation. Thank you very much. Um, in the chat is the link to the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, the main page. Uh, the recording from this gathering and from all gatherings will be posted there. Um, please join us next week for a conversation about raising anti-racist children. Um, and uh, so we'll be continue to be live gatherings on Tuesday evenings at this same time. Uh, we're going to move to wrap up now. As you um, uh, leave, there will be a very short survey that pops up, very feedback, uh, short feedback. We invite you to just take a few minutes and offer your feedback to the quick questions that are there. Um, that will be very helpful for us all. So thank you once again for being here. Um, blessings on your evening and thanks to everyone for your participation. Take care. Bye. <laughs>